restart the new seminar series this uh, semester. It's amazing to you know to have Hillary Johnson all the way from DC. Um, so I know her for a very long time now. Um, we go way back. We've been co-authors on some of the some of the different papers that we've worked together over the years. Uh, and she is the head of EAP uh, Gender Innovation Lab, which uh, is part of the Chief Economist Office as well. And essentially, the Gender Innovation Lab is working on you know closing gender gaps with innovative solutions, testing rigorous solutions. And you know, it's I, I think one of the best examples of you know turning um, rigorous evidence into operational uh, portfolios within the bank. I think it's you know lots of good things to talk about the Gender Innovation Lab. But uh, I'm very glad to introduce her here. Uh, she's going to talk about decision making at agency uh, and from the evidence in the Philippines. So over to you, Hillary. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you everyone for coming. It's nice to all be in the same room together. Um, so indeed, I'm going to be presenting on when decision making reflects agency with evidence from the real Philippines. And this is joint work with co-authors at the University of the Philippines, including Aries Arge and Alethea Valenciano, as well as um, colleagues at the World Bank, Alethea Donald and Forrest Jarvis. So why are we looking at this? Um, first, it's important to recognize the role of agency in development. Um, in Amartya Sen's capabilities approach, he notes that enabling individuals to exercise their reasoned agency is both the principal means and the primary ends of development. So agency matters for development, both as an instrument, um, enabling people to um, do things aligned with their goals and values, as well as kind of the end, you know, the goal of development is to enable people to be able to exercise their agency. And what do we mean by agency? Um, a common definition um, put out by Nelly Kabir in 1999 is the ability to define one's goals and to act on them. So often um, agency is part of development programs, um, especially programs uh, related to women's empowerment. And decision-making is often used as a proxy of agency, when, as, as an important component of thinking about agency. Um, many uh, development programs will capture who makes decisions over different household things um, and, and individual choices as well. For example, consumption or children's schooling or reproductive choices. Um, but there's a number of theoretical and methodological critiques of um, decision making as a measure of agency. And so what we do in this paper is we empirically test some of these critiques um, using a unique spousal survey from the Philippines. And then we complement this with qualitative work to better understand why certain aspects of decision making are related to agency, whereas others are less related to agency. Our findings are relevant because um, we empirically document some of the concerns in the methodological and theoretical literature, as well as we suggest very practical improvements for how to better measure decision making in a way that captures agency um, through just adding a couple of survey questions that wouldn't dramatically um, increase the length of surveys. So it's important for us to be thinking about you know, how we measure this and how we capture this and how we think about it because it matters for the design of programs, it matters for how we measure the impact of our programs um, and the extent to which projects are actually achieving their goals. So this is why we're looking at this. Um, and our, we have two main research questions. First is to what extent are different aspects of decision making reflective of agency? And here we're looking at three different aspects. The fact of being a decision maker, um, having input into the decision making process, and having the ability to make one's own personal decisions if you want to. Um, and a quick preview of our findings, because I can't talk about the second research question without it. Um, we find that being a decision maker is not really correlated with agency. Um, whereas uh, having input and being able to make your own personal decisions is. And so the second question is then, well, why isn't being a decision maker highly reflective of agency? And so we delve into this both through our quantitative findings, but as well as the qualitative work that we did. 
So for the rest of the presentation, I want to start with talking a bit more about the conceptual framework. I know not everybody is an expert in the empowerment and agency literature, so um, we'll cover the definitions of key terms and concepts, um, think about the theoretical and methodological critiques um, in the literature about uh, just using decision making as a proxy of agency and, and talk about the conceptual setup for this. Um, then I'll tell you about the data and empirical setup of, a, of this paper, our, our quantitative findings, our qualitative findings, and then finally, what does this all mean? So starting with the conceptual framework, um, we probably all heard the term empowerment. What do we actually mean by this? Um, empowerment is best conceived as a process, not a static state. It's a process by which those who have been denied the ability to make strategic life choices acquire that ability. And empowerment requires three things. It requires agency, resources, and outcomes. These are the, the components of uh, thinking about empowerment. So uh, in order to you know, make strategic life choices and, and you know, develop in this process, you need agency, the ability to you know, set your own goals, align with your goals and values, and, um, and, and work to achieve this. You need the resources to do this. Um, and you need to be able to influence your outcomes, right? Um, and while we zoom in on agency in this paper, I wanted to start by thinking about this because you will hear the role of resources um, and, and, and outcomes in, in the work. So I think it's nice to think about it in the broader context um, of empowerment. So when we think about agency, there's basically uh, three things related to agency. One is what's called autonomy. This is the ability to define goals in line with your values. Um, this is often measured through what's called the relative autonomy index, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, a second component uh, is the ability to make strategic life choices. And this is captured through decision-making measures. And then finally, um, there's central control over one's life and choices. So feeling that you can influence your life. Um, and this is commonly measured with different scales, like the locus of control or different self-efficacy scales. Can I ask a clarifying question? Of course. Um, so in terms of making strategic life choices, uh, it depends on where you are in your life stages. So if I'm a teenager, I want to do something that I want. Mm -hmm. And it, I have agency because I'm able to do it. But I may not be the most, the best life choice that I can make relative, according to what most people think. So how does that then, um, how does that align with agency? Like, do we think about ability to make strategic life choices as a strategic, uh, according to what most people think, or strategic based on what the person themselves think? Thank you very much for the question. Um, the idea would be to make it aligned with your own personal goals and values, right? Not the goals and values that others have for you. Um, and when we get to talking about autonomy in a bit more detail. We'll talk about this because you can have autonomous motivations where it's really what I think is best for me. There's interjected um, motivations where I do what I do because I want to be seen as a good, whatever it is, I want to align with expectations for me. Um, and then there's uh, external motivations where I do what I do because somebody tells me I have to do it this way. So here, when we're thinking about agency, we're really thinking about my values, my goals, my priorities, and whether I can make my life align with that, whether or not it's what society thinks is good for me. Yes? One more good. question. Yeah, yeah. Just try to, uh, how do we think about the individual versus the household? Or in other words, like when we are measuring these things, how do we think about the different constraints that may be at play, you know, uh, in terms of decision making or defining values itself might be endogenous depending on, you know, where in life I am. I would love to be a painter, but I have to be an economist because I put food on the table, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I understand. You know, what do you think about that? Like, you know, so you, you yeah. said society, but what about the family and the... So it's, here we're thinking mostly about one's individual self. Mm -hmm. um, and we will see that one reason that decision making doesn't always reflect agency is because of these other constraints, either external constraints in society 
or um, like remoteness and poverty or uh, constraints related to the household and the intra-household dynamics about um, intra-household power dynamics are at play. But then you can also think about constraints like I may not be able to make the choices aligned with my goals and values because um, of the constraints that, I, that my household and my face. I can't be a painter, even though that's aligned with my goals and values, because I am constrained in my choices to make choices that will allow my family to survive. Mm -hmm. So here, when we're thinking about how much agency you have, we're thinking about how much you can make those choices aligned with your goals and values um, in the context of a household, in the context of external constraints. So you may or may not have as much of that agency if you face a whole lot of different constraints, either imposed by your household or imposed by society. Maybe I'm jumping ahead, but just maybe has fixed ideas in my head. So if you think about, say, this common core of questions that are often used from the DHS, you know, the demographic yeah. and health service. So about who gets to decide whether you go to meet relatives, how household purchases, how would you define them according to your definition now? Because I would now say maybe I was meshing them over these distinctions you want to make. Mm -hmm. So if I want to think very precisely, would you say every question fits into a distinct category according to your schema? Or do you think of that as purely decision making or how would you? This would fit into the decision making. Okay. Um, which is only one component of agency. It's a necessary component, but not sufficient, I guess. So uh, because the way those decisions are made mm -hmm. um, depends on a whole lot of different things. Right? It depends on how much power I have in my household. It depends on um, whether or not I even want to make those decisions. And we will get into all of that in okay. a little bit. So maybe at the end, if I haven't sufficiently covered it, we can come back to it. Mm -hmm. Sounds good? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so in the literature, there's uh, several different critiques of why decision making may not be a great proxy of agency. Um, first is uh, there's issues of measurement. So if you take spousal surveys where both the husband and wife are asked the exact same questions, like those DHS questions mm -hmm. about who in the household makes decisions about X, Y, Z, you will get different answers, roughly half of the time, actually, um, including in, uh, we, we, did a, we have a separate paper with the same data from the Philippines where we delve into that and we look at, um, we, we see that the reason for that is that spouses, at least in the Philippines, are interpreting what it means to make a decision in a different way. So decision making can be kind of a fuzzy concept with different definitions of what it means to make a decision. Um, and so that, you know, this is one critique of why you know, decision making may not be you know, exactly capturing agency because different people think about decision making in different ways. Um, a second critique in the literature is that decision making is really complex. It can be an iterative process, especially when you're thinking it within the household, right? The dynamics are relations that play out over repeated periods, right? And so, um, and there's also lots of ways to influence a decision, um, even if you're not the main decider, right? There's, there's discussions that can take place. You can exercise your influence in different ways. Um, and in addition, um, there, in, in, in some literature, there shows that even if uh, women are publicly acquiescing to their husbands on a decision, they may privately be making different choices and, and kind of hiding that so that you can still influence outcomes even if you're not the main household decision maker. Another critique of decision making is you're ignoring the choice not to choose. If you think that making decisions is, if I make a lot of decisions in my household, then I have more agency. Well, then you're assuming that I prefer to make those decisions, but I may not. There could be reasons that I don't want to. For example, if you think about um, if, if roles are socially prescribed and it's expected that I make decisions about the children and about the food and the things like that, um, if I'm not making the decisions about children and food, I might actually be, have, have more power in my household, right? I might actually have more agency if I am able to overcome these social norms about what I should be doing and do things the way that I want to. So um, and if you're only looking at decision making, you're not capturing this choice not to choose. Um, another issue is that um, you can't always be making decisions in line with your own goals and values, even if you're making decisions. So here, um, a couple of rel relevant things. In many contexts, um, there's joint decision making in the household, 
where the spouses will make the decisions together, but you can't necessarily know the power dynamics, right? That joint can capture a whole lot of different things. And in qualitative work that's been done before, as well as our own qualitative work, we see that, you know, um, joint decision-making captures everything from the, the spouses discuss and debate until they come to a consensus to, I'm going to do this, I'm running it by you for a rubber stamp approval, basically, right? So, you know, the, the joint decision making, I may say I'm a decision maker, but I don't actually, I can't really make that align with my goals and values. That can also be the case if there's a limited choice set, right? If there's external constraints that impose that I can't make all of the decisions that I want to. And then finally, the last point, if I can cover this last one and then we can come back for questions. Um, decision making can be capturing task management. So in particular, when there's limited choices, maybe I'm responsible for making the choice. I'm responsible for the cognitive load of thinking about making the choice. Um, I can have to make these emotionally difficult trade-offs between difficult situations. And so, and, and be responsible for the outcome because I'm the decision maker. So uh, sometimes decision making can be this task management where it's not really being able to meaningfully influence things in my life, um, given the different constraints, but I'm still responsible for making these choices and being responsible for the outcome. And so it's, you know, this extra burden that I have to carry, which is why sometimes a decision making is task management. It may not be very reflective of agency. Yes, questions. Uh, so just to kind of slightly push you on this point, you know, because I mean, in, in theory, I agree with all these distinctions you make, you know, but somehow tying on to Akash's point, I would say that the same case could be made for the other dimensions also you picked at some level. You know, you could think about exactly like he was saying, how do I think of my goals? You know, my goals are influenced, might not be my real goal. Similarly, for every aspect that there are all these, even when I set what are my values, are influenced by who I am around me. I tend to modify my values to be able to better fit in. And over time, I've become kind of aligned with those values because I think that's the best way not to have this kind of internal contradiction within me, right? Yeah. So all I'm just trying to understand is, why is that on this domain you specifically want to make this hard distinction? Because I would say that every component you could argue is a necessary but not a sufficient condition, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good point. Yeah. I think it also gets to something where we're um, maybe it comes back to thinking about empowerment as a process, right? Because my goals and values and directions may shift over my lifetime. They may shift over, you know, the constraints I face around me, right? And so maybe it's thinking about it in, in the process. And here I'm talking about things a little bit more binary than I necessarily think about them. These are also, I, I didn't put all of the references. Um, you look at the paper, there's a list, the slide would have been just a whole bunch of different names. <laughs> so all of these critiques are very much backed up by um, critiques in the literature. Um, so here, I'm not necessarily even saying my own personal thoughts, although I do think that a lot of these things are very relevant. Um, and I'm not sure whether I've done a sufficient job of answering your concern, but I think it's a very valid point. But I think thinking about it as a process is a very helpful way of, of going about it and realizing that it's not a one-off shot. Yes, I, I just like uh, seeing these slides. I, I have a thing that in some cultures, there are like the family ties up and background is something like that, that we used to grow up with uh, what we can say uh, derived expectations from the family. Mm -hmm. So if your father is a doctor, it's like everybody knows that you one in, in, in your phase of life, you uh, try to be a doctor. So it's it's not the individual's choice. It's like it's not like imposing something, but it's it, within the environment, and it's we can like uh, this is an economic term, I think, like derived expectations of uh, yeah. So it's very difficult to distinguish whether I want it or like I cannot even point out like which point of time <laughs> it becomes like I want to be a doctor. Like it's my dream, but I don't know the source of my dream. And maybe after at the age of 20, 24, I found like doctoring, like medical is not my field, but uh, in my whole life, I want to be a doctor and I, I'm lost like from where this expectation or like till 20, it was my goal. I, I studied on science and take bio, taking biology and everything. 
So uh, I think sometimes it's difficult uh, in some of the cultural contexts, specifically Asian and South Asian countries, like in the family, you grow up with some derived expectation that you cannot even like separate from your own ambition of your life, uh, unless you are like capable of thinking of your own. And another point that I want to think is that uh, in this research, the basic is that decision making is uh, um, connected to empowerment mm -hmm. and with agency or sort of something like this. If I, if I, since I'm not a, you know, we're, we're trying to understand to the extent to which decision making is capturing agency. Yeah, yeah. So my ability but, to. But, but uh, nowadays there is another concept like the stress of decision making. People feel more independent when they don't need to take some decisions. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I'm like, if I can pass on 50% of my decision, I will feel more empowered. Mm -hmm. Like some, there is somebody else to take care. I don't want to take this kind of decisions yeah. making. So that is another thing. If decision making makes me empowered, uh, I'm not looking for that empowerment in, in some extent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely there are basic, there are want the choice not to I'm choose sorry. actually. I'm sorry if I like, it, it, it's, a, it's just something off beat. No, these are very relevant points, and you're actually making my job a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> when we get to the relative autonomy index, we don't actually see the, the factors in our data that are predicted by theory. And very much because of this cultural point about it, people not really distinguishing between my own goals and values and what I think is expected of me. So hold on to that thought, because it'll make the rest of my job much easier when we get to a couple slides later. And I think this point about you'd be much happier about um, not having to make 50% of the decisions, that's exactly the critique number three, ignoring the choice not to choose. So you actually do want a choice. You want a choice not to choose. Um, and there's actually a book out there called The Paradox of Choice um, that talks about why people who have uh, more choices are often less happy because <laughs> there's the stress about the making of the choice. Um, so. You know, in, in a true, if, if I had all of the agency in the world, I would be able to choose the choices that I make and that I don't make and, you know, maybe delegate choices to other household members or, or things like that. So agreed 100%. And I don't think it's, I think it, this is very much the critique that's in the literature um, that, 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 uh, that you're mentioning. Thank you. So coming back to the conceptual framework for this paper, um, remember there were kind of three components of agency. Autonomy, the ability to define goals in, in line with your values, the ability to make strategic life choices, and the sense of control. We're really zooming in in this paper on uh, these first two components. So um, we think, you know, our, what we're positing is that decision making would be reflective of agency if it's contributing to my autonomy that's related to my ability to make the choices aligned with my goals and values, right? Um, and so we're really thinking that these two are together, and I have another slide where we, we talk about that a little bit more. So thinking about autonomy, um, this is a very, this is a simplified version of uh, self-determination theory um, posed by Ryan and Decky in 2000. Um, they actually have other regulatory styles in there. We zoom in to focus on the, the, the most common ones that are, are used. But um, autonomy is best thought about as a continuum, right? So at one extreme, you have non-self-determined behavior. And at the other, you have self-determined behavior. Um, so the motivation behind my behavior that's non-self-determined is extrinsic. So this is externally regulated. So this is, I'm doing something because somebody tells me I have to and I need to comply because I'm afraid of what happens if I don't comply. If I deviate from this, there's going to be sanctions on me. So in, in those kinds of contexts, I do what I do. My behavior is determined by you know, coercion, essentially, whether it's somebody forcing me to do it or whether it's, you know, if I don't do it, I'm going to fear, I'm going to face sanctions and I, whether those sanctions are, you know, actual things or whether it's social sanction, right? So I do what I do so that I don't go over the line and get in trouble, basically. Um, on the other extreme, you have self-determined behavior, um, which is guided by intrinsic motivation. So I'm doing what I do because I enjoy it, because I think it's the best thing for me, because I think it's the best thing for my family, because I have interest in doing this, right? So there's the two extremes. And somewhere in the middle, there's what we call introjective regulation. So this is 
um, what you were talking about, I do what I do because I want to um, satisfy others' expectations. So in the example you gave, I study to be a doctor because my parents say that I should be a doctor and I want to be a good daughter and good daughters listen to their parents. And so I want to be a doctor because I want to make my parents happy and satisfy these expectations that are placed on me. And maybe I want to be a doctor, but it's hard to, to distinguish between what I want and what I'm doing because other people want me to do it. Or in another example, I, um, I stay home to take care of the kids because I want to be a good mother and good mothers stay home to take care of their kids. And so I'm staying home to take care of the kids because I want to be a good mother and, and, and that's what good mothers do, right? So, um, you know, this is what interjective regulation is. So when we're, when we're thinking about this in the, in, in the concept of this paper, we're thinking that if decision-making is reflective of agency, it should be associated with autonomous motivation. So if I'm making decisions aligned with my goals and values, agency, um, then it should be aligned with what I think is a good decision, right? Um, and so we would expect these two things to be correlated if decision-making captures agency. Um, so measures of decision-making, there's different ways of capturing decision-making um, in the data. And so measures that show this relationship with economy, with autonomous motivation, would be better indicators of agency than ones that do not. This is really the, the crux of the theory of the paper, and we'll get into the empirics. Yeah. Just a yeah. question. Is yeah. this notion of like time consistency uh, important for agency at all, or not really? Because I mean, I can see that you can you can have uh, autonomy and and you can be autonomous in defining your goals, and you can be strategic, right? Mm -hmm. So that will satisfy the definition of agency, but that can change over time. I mean, it definitely yeah. change over time, but it can change too much. So yeah. is it, it, time consistency over your goals and, and, and the, and the, and, and the strate uh, uh, strategy to reach those goals important for, for agency or, or not that all? I, I don't think so. I think thinking about it in the context of process and also not a binary, right? Because you can also be, ha, have a lot of agency over certain areas of your life, but not others, right? Maybe you have a lot of agency over um, how things happen with your household and, 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 and you know, the, how you're raising your kids together. Um, but maybe you don't have that much agency over your work because you have to feed the family and there's not that many jobs available. So you can have... Um, agency in some domains and not really others. Um, and remember thinking about empowerment generally as a process, right? So your agency, your level of agency can be changing over time. Um, maybe as you get more independent or you have more resources available to you, you can, you can exercise that. So I think the important thing here is to not to think about it as a static, okay. um, singular thing. So, you know, I guess the one challenge in, in data is that we're looking at a static point in time. Um, but I think what our results are showing are, um, you know, helping us think about what, how decision making relates to agency. Um, and this could be true in different contexts and over time, and it's about a relative. I would say it's more about relative than kind of an absolute. So what data are we using? We're using a spousal survey of households of agrarian reform beneficiaries in the rural Philippines. Most of our sample is in, on the island of Mindanao, um, with some in the Bicol region. So this was collected as part of a baseline survey for an impact evaluation of a land reform program. And I mentioned that, um, A, because you know, it's not representative data. <laughs> That's why we're not using representative data, because it was collected um, but we have very rich outcomes, so that's the benefit. Um, and I also mentioned the impact evaluation of the land reform program because some of our findings are a little bit specific to the context. Um, there's, uh, so basically these households had received land through um, this program that redistributed large swaths of agricultural land in the Philippines to smallholder farmers. Um, and as a condition of this, uh, they're not allowed to sell the land or lease the land, they, and they need to be tilling it um, in order to not lose control over the, the land. Mm -hmm. um, and this baseline survey was taking place um, 
prior to the land being parcelized. So it had been distributed as collective land titles, not because people were farming collectively, but to do it faster. And so um, the impact evaluation was looking at the impact of going back and subdividing these titles later. So basically, what's relevant here is the sales and lease restrictions and um, the requirement to till and the, the fact that you know, the government was going to be coming back to them soon to help them parcelize. So you know, they probably need, are extra thinking about needing to show that they still can control this land. The interviews took place in, in 2018. Um, we have a sample of 993 individuals, of which 423 matched monogamous couples. Um, the, the age is older than kind of the, the general population because of this land reform program, um, where a lot of the land was redistributed in the 80s, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, so our average sample age is 50 for women and 54 for men. Um, most of them are poor households, 48% are below the national food poverty thresholds, um, and the average household size is, is just under five. Are these um, 570 people of single household? And sing um, yeah, either we, either we weren't able to interview the spouse or their widows or um, uh, not married. But they're not included in the sample age. Right? Um, I, I would need to double check. But I think they are included in most of the regressions about, except when it's whether the spouse agrees on decision making. Okay, thank you. We also did qualitative work um, with 40 couples. Um, 20 of these were done with the spouses in the same room, so we could see how they can kind of complete the information that the other provides, also assess a little bit of the dynamics. Um, and then 20 of the couples were interviewed separately. So the wife is interviewed by one person, the husband was interviewed by one person simultaneously where they can't hear the other's responses so that we can you know, delve deeper into each person's thoughts. Um, so this took place in three provinces and with a sample very similar to the quantitative one, not the exact same one because of concerns about survey fatigue. So is it the same question or a different question? Different questions. So here we delve, we, we, it's, it's very open-ended. They were semi-structured interviews where we were asking them about how decisions are made in your household. What do you think about decision-making? How would you prefer to be making decisions? Um, things of that nature. So uh, on our key variables, um, looking at decision-making, we have questions about who makes decisions. So when decisions are made regarding whatever activity, who usually makes these decisions? This is kind of your standard DHS questions um, that are used most commonly. And we create a binary outcome variable, whether the respondent is a decision maker. So, um, we do it combining sole and joint decisions or um, also looking at sole decisions. Um, we also look at how much input would you say you have in decisions regarding this activity, um, where the answer options are input in most or all decisions, input in some decisions, no input or input in few decisions. Um, and we create a binary outcome um, focused in on whether the person has input in most or all decisions. Um, when we get to robustness, we also check to see whether if we code it differently with um, most and some together, whether the results hold, and basically they do. Um, this is taken from the WEA, the, the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index, um, as is the next question, which is, to what extent do you feel you could make your own personal decisions regarding this activity if you wanted to, um, with the answer options being to a large extent, a small extent, not at all. Again, here we create a binary to a large extent, um, and then we also test with robustness to combining to a large and small extent. Um, and we, uh, we, because there's lots of different domains, we aggregate them with the uh, z-score index of these variables. Getting to the RAI, so the Relative Autonomy Index, um, this is asked through vignettes. Um, so remembering those different types of motivation, basically um, people are asked three separate questions and then this is uh, coded according to the, the people who develop the scale with different weights for different types of motivations. So, um, for example, we ask, Annalyn plants the crops on her parcel that she does because her spouse or someone else tells her that she must plant those. She does what they tell her to do. Are you like this person? 
um, completely the same, somewhat the same, somewhat different, completely different. Um, for introductory motivations, Pedro plants the crops in his parcel that he does because most other people in his community plant them and he wants to be seen as making good decisions with his parcel. How do you like this person? Capturing autonomous motivations. One plants the crops on his parcel that he does because he thinks those are the best crops to be planting, and he thinks that's what's best for his parcel. If he changed his mind on what to plant, he would plant other crops. How do you like this person? So this is capturing those different domains, and it's asked about choosing crops, where to sell your crops, and um, choosing to sell or lease the parcel. So when we went to construct the index, yes? Do we need to worry about measurement? Error in these questions because you know I, I might be something, but I'll just say yeah, I'm amazing, right? So that's what the scales are for. Um, so the, the we, we work with psychometricians on this, um, and we first conducted an exploratory factor analysis to see whether the scale is measuring the latent characteristics expected. So the latent characteristics are those three motivational categories. Um, and we find two, three factors emerge, but not the three that we expected. Um, we find two motivational factors, and then one domain-specific factor about selling parcels, which is probably coming from the sensitivity of um, selling parcels in this, in this context. Um, so then we run a confirmatory factor analysis on how we're doing constructing the scales um, to see what is the scale construction that's best fit for the data. Um, and here, coming back to the point about the doctors, we actually find that autonomous and interjected motivations cluster together very closely. So people aren't really distinguishing in this context between I do what I do because I think it's the best and I do what I do because I want to be seen as a good farmer. Right? So people aren't really making that distinction in this context. So what we do um, is similar to other papers that have found that things don't necessarily cluster the way they're expected um, and run it on a two-factor version of the, the RAI. Um, that clusters together autonomous introductory motivations and then external motivations. So they answer all these three questions for each of the domains, exactly. right? Exactly. So they basically they answer nine different vignettes. <coughs> and then you use those answers to construct a scale, which is weighted. Because remember, there's four answer options, right, for each one. And so remember, autonomy is thought of as a continuum, right? I can do what I do because I think it's the best and because I think I want to be seen as, good, as a good farmer, right? That like more than one of these things, they're not necessarily binary, right? It's not because I say that um, I do it because I think it's the best that I cannot say that I do it because um, other people tell me I should do it this way too. But it could, and what and what would the scale do if somebody okay. said like first, like the first one was I crop plants because my spouse told me, and I say exactly that's what I do, and then on the Autonomous one also, I say exactly what I do. And then if I, then what are these kind of people? Can they, do these kind of people crop up in the data at all? Um, I would need to go back to the data to double check, but the way that it's handled in the scale construction is the autonomous motivations are rated as, I think, plus three. Okay. And interjected as plus one, and coerced as negative three. Okay, so it's canceled. So there's a, exactly. Okay. So it, it, you get basically a variable. Um, for some reason, I'm thinking between negative nine and nine, but now I'm doubting myself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because it's been a while since I look at the actual data. Um, but yeah. Then, yeah. So you have this kind of scale that's measuring kind of where you fall on the spectrum. And so our empirical strategy puts this REI variable on the left, so my autonomy on the left. And then we regress it on these different decision-making variables, including um, controls and, and province fixed effects. We select the controls using lasso um, to, to choose from a giant um, list of potential variables. And then in equations five and six, um, we uh, put all of the decision-making variables together in the same regression. So our, most of our results were looking at um, decision maker, whether I say I'm a decision maker, but then we also check and see whether um, it, it's different when spouses agree that the person's a decision maker. Um, remember, because of that critique that there could be fuzzy thoughts about decision making. So can you remind us what is input? Yes, this is coming from that um, second question. How much input would you say you have in decisions? And then the, uh, the, the last one is the what extent could you make your own personal decisions? 
So the numbers are probably a little bit small, but the key takeaway in this um, descriptive table is that not all decision makers have input. So if you look at throughout it, all of these different domains um, for both men and women, the share of people who consider themselves to make to be a decision maker is larger than the share that say they have input. So these are capturing distinct domains like, or distinct factors, um, distinct aspects of decision making. And, you know, this suggests that, you know, aligned with critiques in the literature, just because you're making a decision doesn't mean you have input, right? There's, there can be the um, constraints like poverty or remoteness or um, gender dimensions in the household that affect this. Um, also with the description statistics, we see um, that the numbers of people who consider themselves to be the only decision maker in the household do not align with the number of people who say they could make their own personal decisions if they wanted to. Um, generally, there's a larger share of women who say, I can make my own personal decisions if I want to, but I'm not a sole decision maker. So, you know, here we're kind of hearing echoes of that choice not to choose. I could make the decision, but I don't. Um, and then we also see that Fewer men tend to say they can make their own personal decisions if they want to than men who say, I'm the only decision maker. So this is echoing this thought that there can be other constraints um, in my choices uh, where I can't make my own personal decisions even if I'm the decision maker. Getting to our regression results. Um, so here, we, this is the looking at it for women. And we see that there is a positive but weakly significant correlation between being a decision maker and autonomy for women. And it stays basically the same when you're looking at whether uh, spouses agree that, um, that she's the decision maker. So it doesn't seem that um, you know, the weaker correlation is coming from you know, fuzzy measurement. Um, when we look at input, we see that there's a stronger relationship, significant at the 1% level, between how much input I say I have in making a decision and my autonomy. And the strongest by far, that completely values a difference, um, is the, whether I can make my own personal decisions if I wanted to. So we find the most strong relationship um, between a decision-making variable and autonomy for if I can make my own decisions if I want to. We see something similar for men, except for men, uh, being a decision-maker is not correlated with autonomy. Um, it's not statistically significant, and uh, when spouses agree that the man is the decision-maker, um, it, it, dis the significance disappears when you introduce controls. One question. Yeah. What did we make of the size of the coefficients? You know? So it's basically saying going on the ability scale from zero to one gives me only twenty percent autonomy. Is that it's a, um, it, it's a so a one standard deviation increase in it um, increases the um, the RAI scale by that. It, it, yeah. the, the the magnitude is a little bit hard to interpret in practical terms because also like. How far do you move along the scale? It's a. Uh, so you say something about. We focus a bit more on just kind of the significance and, and relatively which one is more. Do the, the, we need to think something about like you know, autonomy comes from so many different things rather than just the ability to make decisions? Is that, uh, is that what it is? Hmm. But at some level, the variance that this index is able to explain is quite small, like you point out. No, like yeah. the R square is always less than ten percent, basically. That's a good thought. I, it's not something I thought about before. Um, what else determines agency? So decision making. It's one is like more measured. But it's also like a even in, in the best form. Mm -hmm. It smells. Uh, it explains. Only a little bit of my autonomy. Yeah. I bet it comes down to thinking about it as kind of the whole picture, right? Because my agency or my empowerment is related also to my resources and my outcomes. So maybe things like education level or, you know, where I live may play a big role in whether I can set, I can sure. do things in line with my goals and values, my culture, um, 
So there could be a lot of other things, maybe that's the next paper. <laughs> but you do account for all of these controls also, like education. Uh... Yeah, the specific controls we have is whether or not the person themselves is the land reform beneficiary, whether it's their spouse, um, education level, the age difference between the spouses, right. and how much sex effects. Those were the ones that the, the machine learning right. said were mm -hmm. the best controls to use. I, I can't stop thinking about the people who are in like single um, household in a way where they might have kids and but they they don't have a spouse. So for those people, the RAI, RAI should be one or close to one um, because they, there's no negotiation with the other partner and what decision they have to do. But if it's not one, then it could be the external factor that you're talking about, right? It could be the resources that's available to them that's not enabling them to do the, the giving them the full agency. Would that be right way of thinking of it? That's a really interesting way of thinking about it. Um, you know, I think this comes to Kasha's point. So, but in this paper, it's more about the relationship between. Remember, we saw that like just because I'm making the decision by myself doesn't mean that I am making the decision that um, is, is, would be my personal decision if I wanted to. But right? in this case, yeah. um, so in a case like that, basically being the sole decision maker doesn't necessarily map to having input on the decision. We saw that in the descriptive statistics. Right. And being the sole decision maker doesn't necessarily mean that I'm always making my own personal decisions. Um, now, when thinking about it like in relative terms, um, it might be something to think about in terms of thinking about Akasha's question. If decision making is only one aspect of it, what is it that's determining autonomy? Um, the only thing is, I bet the households are very different, right? Um, you know, if they're single, um, single parent households, or if they're widows, or they're, you know, that they, they may look different and so it might be hard to, we wouldn't be comparing apples to apples right if we were to compare the households that uh with a single person this decision is just to plant crops right in, in the, the the ones in the rea are choosing uh the crops and choosing where to sell the crops um and then there's the choosing to lease or sell the parcel for these it didn't come out well. Um, so when we put all of them together, um, we see that only the decision to make your own personal decision, if you want to, remains significant. So if we kind of put the three measures of decision making, I make a decision, I have input in decisions, mm -hmm. and I can make my own personal decisions if I want to. Mm -hmm. The only one that... Um, is strongly correlated with autonomy is this ability to make my personal decisions if I want to. Um, it's similar for, for women and men, and whether we're thinking about the decision maker variable or whether spouses agree. And, and these decisions are also this, exactly the same domains as the RAI or what domain? Was? No, they're, they're agricultural mostly. So the domains include, ah, yeah, okay. so that it doesn't map one to one, but it's mostly yeah. mm -hmm. farming and decisions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the qualitative work, um, we find echoes of external constraints concerns. So households um, were often facing very difficult choices. For example, allowing another farmer to till the land and risk losing it um, because they're not tilling it themselves, or uh, keep it in their position without having the inputs to till it, which again, they could lose it because not to leave. Um, or after a typhoon, they had the choice whether to find ways to plant additional crops or they have to sell their possessions. Um, you know, hearing from the beneficiaries, a couple of quotes illustrating this point, we plant whatever we have as long as we have something to plant. There's nothing else because that's all we can do here. Our problems are financial. I don't think I will be able to eat that's my life now. I cannot dream of anything anymore. So, you know, these households are making restricted choices in a context of high poverty um, and, and natural disasters where they don't always have the ability to 
make choices in line with their goals and values. So that's why being a decision maker, you know, one reason why being a decision maker may not be capturing um, autonomy. Um, another thing that we heard in the qualitative data are echoes of this household level constraints. Um, so most of the decisions were made in consultation. There's a very strong norm that decisions need to be made jointly within the household. But the reasons why they were doing it jointly kind of varied. Some of them genuinely said, I want the input of my spouse, uh, or I want to improve the outcomes of the decision. Maybe they have better ideas. Um, but there was also a very strong notion that decisions are made together to avoid blame um, for the outcome. So uh, as captured by one beneficiary, the ideal decision making is done by both of us. This is to avoid trouble. When the decision is final, no one will, is to be blamed. But when the decision is made alone, everyone will be pointing fingers when things get bumpy. So, you know, thinking about it as the, like the responsibility for the decision, um, you know, this concern about blame, the weight of the decision making is, is something that's very relevant. Um, and we also heard that, you know, the level of consultation varied and is often dominated by the husband. He's the pillar of the household. If you're the wife, it's enough that you concur. Um, and another thing is, is that sometimes people would be deferring, in particular women, would be deferring to their spouse because they say, well, he knows more about farming, so I prefer to go to defer to him on, on matters of farming. So um, it may or may not be capturing my goals and values, but that might be shaped by, you know, what's going on at this household level. Yeah. And then we also hear echoes of decision making as task management. So a lot of decisions being relatively inconsequential, paying utility bills, daily budgeting, planting vegetables for household consumption, not things that are going to be kind of earth shattering important decisions, but they would still take time and require effort. Um, and also, you know, again, you hear this echo of making decisions includes choosing from a, a limited choice set. We plant what we have because that's all we can do. Uh, and, you know, the, this core feature that, you know, decision making means responsibility for the outcome. So this, you know, decision making is, if I'm a decision maker, it's I'm responsible for the outcome. I'm responsible for doing all of this work, for thinking about this, for, you know, debating between these difficult choices um, that we have. Uh, or for doing all of these inconsequential things. Um, so this might be another reason why decision making may not be aligned with uh, my, my goals and values. So basically to sum up, um, why isn't decision making accurately capturing agency? We find it's overly broad in this context um, because respondents are still considering themselves as decision makers, even when they cannot influence the decision making process meaningfully um, to be aligned with their goals and values. Um, even when there's uh, consultative decision making between spouses, but that consultation doesn't mean much. Um, and they're even considering themselves decision makers when there's limited input they can have into the, 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 the outcome based on poverty or scarcity around them. Uh, input is more reflective of agency in our data. Um, and, you know, this is likely coming from the fact that it's limited to cases where I can actually meaningfully influence the process and outcome. And then finally, uh, we find the ability to make your own personal decisions, if you want to, is uh, even sh more strongly correlated with, uh, with your agency. Because not only are you capturing the ability to meaningfully influence the process and outcomes by making your personal decisions, it's also accounting for this choice not to choose. Um, so what does this mean? First, um, it, it's a word of caution about overemphasizing decision making kind of generally as like who makes decisions in that kind of binary DHS way. Um, it's critical to ensure that, you know, if you're thinking about agency, that one's actually able to make decisions aligned with their preferences. Um, and it also suggests that decision making can be costly in terms of the cognitive load and the fear of blame. Um, so, you know, overemphasizing choice <laughs> and decision making may not actually always be helping people um, have more agency over their lives. Um, and then in very practical terms for researchers, um, asking a, a couple of additional questions about the input you have and the ability to make your own personal decisions if desired would be um, good to include in surveys where you care about um, capturing agency. 
So I'm sorry we went a bit over time for the presentation, but I think it's because we had some really nice discussions in the middle. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I have a few questions, um, but I'll turn to the floor as well for, for additional questions. Um, Hillary, uh, yes. very exciting presentation. Um, you know, I think just to summarize some, some of the comments that have also come up um, earlier, has there been a, you know, in the literature, has there been an adaptation of the agency framework, conceptual framework for the Asian culture? I think there was a discussion about like, you know, how in the Asian culture, the, the role of self and community is a little bit more blurred. And, you know, what's good for me may also be the same as what's good for the society. And, you know, like going back to Akash's point about like, how, what does agency come, I, I guess like what explains agency and where does it come from, right? And, and to some extent, like in, you know, in our houses, we grow up, learning some of this wants and direct expectations, for example. Um, so, you know, through the interpretation of the results, right? Like it, it could have, you know, what if what's wrong is not the decision-making as an instrument to measure agency, but the conceptual framework of agency that's not correctly capturing, you know, agency in the Asian culture, for example, in this context. Do we want to go yeah, question by okay. question? Or do we want to go take another question and then okay. I just want to ask, like, you know, uh, maybe like your potential follow up to this. I mean, like, you asked about the high or low and low uh, expenditure done by household. So, what about things like agriculture insurance? Because you talk about like people complaining about, um, about the, the, the agriculture impact, the climate impact on the agriculture. So, things like, you know. Uh, does this uh, translate to real world uh, outcome? Things like agriculture insurance, or even like um, <coughs> real world uh, intervention, like you not know, doing seminar or workshop that involve maybe the only the husband or maybe the wife, and how this like in a way translate into the uh, the type of decision that you are looking at. So, in a way, like bringing outside uh, intervention or outside outcome inside your framework. So that's like my question. Yeah. Sorry, so I'm gonna, my question is a little bit different. Are, are there situations where, you know, we care about decision making as much as empowerment or agency, especially in, um, when mm. it comes to women, right? And I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking about like, you know, based on your presentation, which was excellent, conditional cash transfers programs or like, you know, a reservation for women in local politics and things like that. Like what are, obviously the outcomes we care about is something else, but like the like child mm -hmm. health and education, but what are these programs doing in your framework? Are they affecting agency? Are they affecting decision making? But they're still contributing to something else. So how do we think about that uh, sort of big picture development questions? These are some great questions. Okay. So maybe we can answer them first. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'll start with this last one. Um, I think the results don't suggest that we should never care about who makes decisions. Um, because it is true in the in like the CCG literature that um, depending on who you give the money to, the outcomes might be different, right? And so that reflects differences in intra-household bargaining and preferences and choice. And so when thinking about who's making the decisions is important when you're thinking about who you would transfer the money to, for example. So I think there's definitely context of uh, where it's relevant to be thinking about who's making the decision. Um, I think what we need to be careful about is that um, you can't necessarily say that that's going to be the empowerment, that that's going to necessarily increase empowerment or agency, right? Because, um, you know, maybe it's increasing the burden uh, on say the mother who's receiving the cash transfer because now she has to manage this. Or maybe it's increasing, you know, the, the tension in the household because now she has an additional source of income and that now she has to navigate that. So by giving, you know, her the money um, like it, it can make sense if she's the one that's going to be making decisions about, you know, things that are relevant and, and, and to the intervention, but we have to be careful to not assume that that's going to directly translate into greater agency or greater empowerment. 
Um, I'll go in reverse order. And, and the, the um, you know, I, I don't know that much about agricultural insurance, although one of the, the co-authors on the broader impact evaluation was looking at agricultural insurance in the context. Um, but thinking about, you know, how this translates in, into real world applications, uh, the impact evaluation actually showed that contrary to expectations, um, or just we were surprised by the fact that the first stage in the land uh, parcelization process for subdivision surveys had been carried out, but title documents had not been issued, actually lowered women's decision-making authority over the land. Um, and when we looked into it, it seemed that some of that was coming from um, the way that the program had been carried out by the government, which did not include both spouses. Both spouses were conjugal property owners by law, but only the, the main beneficiary, who was typically the man, was invited to the information about it, was invited to the subdivision survey, um, was invited to the Poulon Poulon community meetings where they talk about the program. So that may have reinforced notions about whose land it was. So I think you know, it's, an, it's a cautionary example of how, you know, the, um, this pertains to kind of the broader, like, implementation issues that, that, that you're raising. On this tough question about the, whether there's a different framework, I don't know that there's actually a technically different framework for different cultures, but I, I know that it's widely noted in the literature about how much context matters. Um, and I think, you know, our, our results also echo that. And it's also why we are starting, you know, with our measures and how well does this measure that's been validated kind of globally, how does that translate to the context? Um, and we find that it doesn't 100% translate to the context because of the fuzziness between the, I do something because I think it's the best and I do something because I want to be a good farmer, and then this is what good farmers would do. Um, and that, that, that distinction wasn't really relevant. So I think, um, I'm not sure the extent to which there's a need for a completely different framework, but I think that there's a need to be cognizant of how kind of the general framework may apply differently in different contexts or, um, you know, on the research side, how the measures that you're using need to be you know, tailored and adapted to, to the different norms. If I can just uh, yeah. respond very quickly. Um, you know, one possible reason why it might be useful to like, you know, consider a different framework is, you know, there's some kind of like normative value to this measure of agency, right? Like, you know, when we hear about agency, we hear it's, it's positive. Uh, but, um, you know, when we could call this action is autonomous, uh, but my mother would call it rebellious. Um, so, you know, like this, you know, possible dissonance between like, you know, what we consider as a, as a good in the Eastern culture or the, the Asian culture could be different. Okay, uh, we're running out of time. Um, unless there's like one more burning question, I think we, we could continue the conversation offline after the seminar and then she's going to be staying around so feel free to ask more questions okay we'll ask questions. Yes, the, the, without adding his team so what do you think the future based on directions okay. is this the last last question or there were well, other hands just, just like a very small one so i think you mentioned earlier about like there's also cost of failure right so in this case uh how could we think about how that plays into like decision making economy in terms of so for example I think these are like, farmers who are gaining uh, access to this program and even it could be uh, this is, like back cash transfers so is there a way to account for maybe have you been successful in applying for these cash transfers in the past and does that affect your decision making or your confidence in decision making as well mm -hmm. like how should we think about like failure or like, the cost of failure uh, in regards to the um, so I'll start with just like the last one, um, the last question first. Um, I think it does kind of show up from the standpoint that, you know, beneficiaries are often talking about fear of blame and, you know, the kind of the fear of like if there's a bad outcome, they want to make decisions together 
with their spouse to avoid, you know, problems that things don't go. And I'm assuming that's probably learning from the past, right? Because remember when we think about kind of the general context about um, how Nyla Kabir talks about this, a, a, a intra-household decision-making is like an iterative process, not a one-off, right? Um, so there were probably moments in the past where one person made a decision and it didn't go well, and then they, you know, bore the responsibility for that. Um, so I think, um, you know, this is capturing the kind of the lessons, like the, the respondents are thinking about those kind of past lessons and their insistence on doing things with consultation um, is, you know, probably part learning from those past uh, failures. And on the future research directions, um, I think there's a lot more that can be done in terms of, um, you know, looking at this in other contexts, first of all. Um, to what extent is decision making addressing agency in other contexts? There's a lot. Um, the, the way of questions and the REI have been collected in a number of different contexts. So it would be nice to kind of replicate this in, in other contexts to see to what extent it's similar or different. Um, I think kind of thinking about the normative value of agency that Daniel brought up, I think that would actually be a really nice area for future directions and how do people think about agency and empowerment in, in different contexts and, and what does that mean more generally, I think would be a very um, nice new research direction. Um, and then thinking about um, the, a lot of the, the measurement of programs out there is talking about, you know, impacting women's empowerment or impacting agency. And they're just kind of using these um, binary DHS, the woman makes a decision as saying, and celebrating the win. But I think there needs to be more nuance in, in, in the future research and thinking about, is it really a win, right, to be, to be shifting those things. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for this excellent uh, seminar. Uh, thank you.